afternoon, everyone. I trust you've all had a great lunch today. Not overindulged, no falling asleep, cheering in the ranks. Um, our speaker this afternoon has been involved in Linux kernel work for as long as most of us have been around there. So I'd like you to introduce you to uh, Christophe Lamita. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Well, I've been involved for the longest time also in high-performance computing with Linux, and uh, one of the, this is one of, dealing with one of the recent issues that came up. Uh, a lot of the band connect connections around the world are being updated right now from 10 gig gigabits to 100 gigabits. These are mostly the presidential cables and stuff. And uh, there are also uh, 100 gig uh, Ethernet adapters available for data centers these days, and people use various protocols to run uh, very high intensive traffic across these links. And uh, some regulatory bodies require you actually to capture all data uh, that goes across your band links to prove when th certain things happen. For example, in the finance industry, when if you do high uh, speed trading, you need to prove that you didn't front run anybody else and that you didn't use the information in the wrong way. So you need to prove when which packet was at which point of your van infrastructure. And therefore, you must capture all the packets. And in, on, on request by the government, you must show when this packet go, when over which wire. Uh, so there is a need for these things. And actually, you need a, quite a number of these, uh, given that you may have an extensive 100 gig uh, uh, infrastructure at some point. So uh, this is something that is a necessity for various industries. And the other thing is, of course, uh, this is also something that the government is interested in, mostly of the uh, my maybe darker companies that want to know everything about uh, traffic patterns going between the continents and uh, want to tap the uh, van traffic. So this is also goes into that area, as well as uh, the big uh, hyperscalers, Facebook, uh, Google, and so on, that which want to do traffic analysis at this level. So this is basically an infrastructure that makes all of this possible. And uh, I uh, try to figure out how to uh, handle this and how to actually make this possible using Linux. Uh, so actually, you have, basically have two problems here. The first problem is uh, there's data going flowing across the wire now. The wire runs around 100 gig. And the first thing is you need to get this stuff into memory somehow. This means you need to have some kind of a networking reception ability to and then store it somewhere. And since you cannot keep all the data in memory, uh, uh, you need to write the data to the disk. And uh, so um, if you want to have a, maybe, maybe you want to just create a small, one new pizza box, a small server that hopefully it does this because you want to replicate this. Uh, and you really want as many 100 gig ports as possible on this, this thing, right? So one is okay for starters, but you want an architecture where you can expand this and maybe you can you need a, have high capacity to disk and you need a high capacity coming into uh, memory. So we want a one new box and no complex setups and no distributed file system. That is a certain problem. If you have a distributed file system, you end up with a rack full of servers and storage environments and all sorts of things, which leads you to uh, a lot of maintenance overhead. You, what you want is a one new appliance that captures the data, and at the end of the day, you can do some stats on it, and you can run processes on the box that, uh, uh, in real time, analyzes the incoming data patterns for certain suspicious activity. Maybe you're looking for uh, people trying to break into your uh, environment. Uh, and so we have restrictions here on the size of the box. Um, so how do we do this? So if we want to receive 100 gigabits Ethernet traffic, uh, we have to first realize how much is this actually? This is 12.5 gigabytes per second. So at an average packet size, maybe two to 300 bytes on the internet, we're looking at about 50 million packets per second. So. Uh, this is, uh, I've talked uh, a couple of years ago about 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet here. And uh, this is something that is uh, way beyond uh, the capabilities of, a, of our current hardware or network stack in Linux. So what kind of approaches are there? Most people only know about one network stack in Linux, which is called the, uh, the TCP IP or the IP stack. And uh, we've had a lot of disagreements with the founders of the, with the, hand, the maintainers of the uh, IP stack since 2003 because they would not allow full offload into uh, the IP stack. So another subsystem has been developing on the side that also does networking, which is called the RDMA subsystem. It was designed to do direct 
uh, DMA transfer between two different machines via a high-speed interconnect. But it also has the ability to receive regular packets and send regular packets, and it can, for example, receive a stream of, uh, of Ethernet packets. So with that, you can uh, basically, um, it allows you to do put an RX and TX ring for a NIC in user to user space. So this means that all the OS overhead of handling and taking packets off the hardware and putting it onto the hardware is gone. With that, uh, you can do 50 million packets per second. But the problem is um, you would have to allocate and, uh, descriptors and free the descriptors for 50 million times per second. That certainly overloads the OS as well. So that, that doesn't work. Um, then uh, one of the vendors, Mellanox, uh, created something called Rx bulking. Uh, this means you, uh, instead of one descriptor per packet, you give one descriptor and say, okay, this descriptor has maybe 10 megabytes of data, and then the, um, the RDMA substance will just stream the stuff in there, one packet after another, without any acknowledgement. With that, you can reduce the number of packets per second in a significant degree because these are all batched in maybe two meg uh, units or something like that. And so uh, if you, let's say, use a block size of two meg, a huge page here, you can need only 6,000 descriptors per second. That is easily handled by the memory subsystem of Linux. And with that, you would be able at least to get the stuff into memory. Uh, so uh, that is done doable with something, an extension of the RDMA system called direct verbs, for example. That is a kind of a vendor neutral way of trying to specify how uh, uh, a reception into these bulk buffers can occur via the RDMA subsystem. Then, uh, but people don't like RDMA, right? So we want to have the regular IP stack. Um, there is something called DPTK, which allows you to directly map the device control uh, uh, memory of a, uh, any NIC into a user space. But that also you can circumvent the kernel and you can operate directly from user space on the NIC. And also with DPDK, you can also get the striding accuse to work and you can do this bulking as well. But you would have to have low level programming going on in user space to interface with the NIC. Then there's a work on pro progress right now, it's not complete yet, to modify the uh, new technologies in the TCP stack, the XTP, where we try the same that the RDMA stuff did, basically what the, what the RDMA has implemented 15 years ago, we're now trying to implement on the network stack and associating it with, with a socket basically uh, allowing you to put uh, RX and TX uh, rings associated with a, uh, with a uh, socket into the, the IP stack. That is in progress and it's called the Barking RX extension. And there's a, a developer, Amir from Mellanox, that's right now pushing this into the IP stack. Hopefully at some point, this will enable the regular IP stack to, to also be able to handle these things. If you do this bulking process and you can reduce the number of uh, things that the kernel has to handle per second. Um, so there are uh, ways to actually do that right now, and there's hopefully more general ways and more IP stack compliant ways uh, happening in the future here. Um, so, um, and right now we need to have special 100 gig hardware. We need to do this bulking. And there's only right now uh, basically you, one vendor, that is a, this is a Mellanox NIX. They have uh, uh, support for the Linux uh, RDMA subsystem. They support XDP, and they support the standard IP stack. So you have three ways of interacting with the NIC, depending on uh, how much effort you want to put in and what's your philosophy of uh, getting the data on there and how much effort you actually, how much knowledge you want to, how much effort you want to spend to get down to the lower level of the hardware. <laughs> uh, that's one way. And the other way is some, some people actually have created uh, custom FPGAs and have implemented their own bulking thing in the FPGAs. And then in the FPGA, you can do more things with a packet because you have a higher, uh, higher parallelism there. Um, then uh, the 100 gig NICs have some issues these days because they're mostly only used for data center connectivity and not for hosts. Uh, so uh, it is very difficult to handle data coming in at that level uh, if you don't do these special things. So just running standard uh, socket-based uh, uh, servers and clients on there may be an issue. Um, there are proprietary extensions in the 100 gig NICs to, for flow control. This means that the NIC is able to segment the 100 gig data flow stream by, let's say, by port number to different uh, CPUs. 
This way, the, the kernel doesn't have to receive the packet and classify it and shift it to each CPU, but the hardware can do this and shift it directly to the uh, buffers on each CPU. With that, you can increase the bandwidth by offloading some of the key processing from the, uh, from the operating system. And, but right now, we, we have various small vendors that are trying to do that, and also uh, now Broadcom is trying to do some extensions on there. But right now, the only functional way that I found was using the Mellanox adapters. And the project that I've done was with the Mellanox Connected 6 adapter. Then uh, the next thing is, okay, you have the data and memory. So um, what do you, how do you get this onto the disk? Uh, we need to provide 12.5 gigabytes per second for each 100 gig NIC that we have in the system. And again, we want, don't want a distributed file system. You want to stay within one new pizza box. So how do we do this? And um, luckily, I got a, a test system from, from Intel called the uh, Intel Ruler, which had 32 uh, SSDs in there, with each was about two to four gigabytes per second write speed. And it's all fitted to a one new system. So that's amazing. But um, there were page cache performance issues. So we, we just, the simplest thing you should do is just, just write it, right? You just use, use, use regular I.O. What happens? You can only get two to three gigabytes per second onto the disk because the CPU, all CPUs are busy just trying to deal with this traffic. Because um, the, um, the Linux page cache requires a, a, a 4K page size to operate on. And so the system needs to operate on these 4K pages and you're having 12.5 gigabytes per second, uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at about three to four million of these 4K things that the kernel has to touch multiple times in one second, which is uh, a bit of an issue. This gets us into uh, workarounds again. Uh, yes, direct I.O. are huge pages uh, that require application modifications. But these two things didn't work because I need to have the data in the page cache because we want to in real time look at this data from other processes that will share the data via the page cache, right? You can't do that with direct O. With direct O, you need, can only have one process write it to disk and the others don't see it until they read it from the disk again. And given that we are already busy with writing 12.5 at least gigabytes per second, we don't want to increase the load I load on the system even more. Um, and huge pages are not supported in the page cache. Hopefully soon Matthew will get that fixed. But we are hopefully, <laughs> at some point, we're going to have that, right? 440 today. Pardon? 440. Uh, 440, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the question was, how do we do this without any uh, uh, patches and stuff like that? So I did it with regular Red Hat 7.5, uh, and I just tried to, to restrict myself to not, to not hacking around, but just configuration of the kernel. So... Um, these, it's the question is how to scale regular I.O. when running on Intel processors. This is a particular issue for Intel processors because of the 4K page size. If you have 4VC, you have 64K pages. If you have ARM, you have 64K page size. You don't have a problem there. This is, works great, straight out of the box. Uh, the only problem is with, with Intel with the gazillions of these pages that are around. So, um, so we, we need to deal, deal with this. So how do we do this? Um, I'm usually more a memory management guy rather than an I.O. guy, so the idea is, okay, you have a load here of uh, calculations going on, uh, basically managing all these 4K descriptors. So you want to spread the load efficiently between all the cores, and you want to minimize the locking between the cores. How do you do this? So, um, so we need to basically optimize the computational you know, uh, thing here. It's like a, an MPI job. <laughs> you distribute the load up, uh, uh, properly. And uh, so, yeah, this is uh, the, again, another description of the problems with uh, x86. But I don't know, how much time do we have? Um, no. Um, so, then there's these other options with direct I.O. and the problem of sharing uh, uh, this stuff. And yeah, the huge pages are tied to direct I.O. As long as the page cache doesn't support the, uh, the huge pages, you can only uh, use them for direct I.O. and then you have to put them to disk in order to read them back from other uh, processes in order to make them use, it makes them useful. And uh, then we get to the hub that I got from uh, Intel. Um, this was this one new box. 
It has 32 SSDs in the front. Uh, it, was, it was a prototype that I got my hands on. Uh, and with SPDK, we were able to run this thing um, at 50 to 56 gigabytes per second. Uh, SPDK means that it's like a DPDK. The device is directly controlled from user space. There is no OS running there. It's just uh, direct low-level hardware programming going on. Uh, we can't use that. We need a page cache because we want processes to share the, the page cache data. Uh, so uh, this is a super micro one U server, uh, 768 gig RAM, has 100 gig Ethernet, and basically two Anuma uh, socks with Skydex CPUs. And uh, what? <laughs> okay, and. Uh, you, uh, it's just 256 gig. Yeah, so they, they will at some point uh, promise me that the system will have one petabyte and one U, which is enough to store maybe one day of line rate of uh, uh, 100 gig traffic. Um, that's what you want, actually. You don't want this uh, traffic to be shift, shifted elsewhere on your co-location site because if you shift the traffic elsewhere on your co-location site, you, you, you separate other network links that you have in your codo, and you don't want that. Right? You want to have this all local and then condense and uh, run uh, stuff on it to get the data that you want, and then it shifts shift the compressed data off, shift of, of, the, of the system, maybe at night or something. So um, this is the basic storage architecture of the system. It's a bit simplifies. We have two Skylake processors with a UPI interconnect, and we have a PCI, PCIe connections going from each uh, um, processor down to uh, 16 of these uh, devices. Uh, so, uh, the 16 MBA meter have a, is uh, connected via a special PCIe switch to the processor. And uh, that is, is, seems to be the golden source here on the system. And uh, uh, the claim is that this will uh, cause, uh, you to allow redundancy and fallback and all the other things between the various uh, drives. I ignored most of that. I just wanted to go you know, and use a local PCIe connectivity to uh, the uh, uh, NVMe drives. So um, what is really happening here also is for, for backup purposes, the PCIe stuff is cross-connected back and forth. So in order to kind of um, make this uh, processor agnostic and then avoid the NUMA effects. But that causes you to kind of mix the locality issues and I didn't want to do that, so I didn't use this at all. So uh, I ran a couple of uh, test scenarios. One test scenario is the no NUMA um, uh, test scenario setup. You just leave, you just create one file system over all, dri all drives and run the test as if this would just be one whole system. We're not doing any NUMA affinities, no nothing, just run it straight. Uh, so that in that case, the Linux kernel determines the placement of all the threads. And uh, this is a very simple configuration. And we will have log contention, of course, across the uh, two nodes and, uh, uh, and across the various cores that will slow us down. But this is, a, this, is, this is an obvious configuration, also the thing that we first tried where we couldn't get the performance. But I think this is very important for uh, comparison with the various other uh, things that you can do. Then uh, the next setup is uh, we try to uh, treat each processor as its own separate thing and run it in parallel. So we're creating two file systems on the local PCIe uh, NVMe devices, and each processor interacts only from its threads with its own and the immediate uh, uh, drives. So uh, in that case, we will have to bind all the threads for each NUMA node uh, uh, to, to, to stay in the proper place. And, and we have to figure out the localities of the various devices and make sure that they are properly uh, arranged. So the Linux kernel is restricted now to scheduling only the threads on its, within a socket. And uh, so this is a basically straightforward NUMA configuration that everybody has also known before. And this is uh, very good for parallelization. It limits the uh, locking contention between the two sockets. And then I read something in the uh, intern manuals about a subclustering NUMA setup. What you can actually do is, uh, if you set a certain thing in the BIOS, the processor is divided into two halves. And suddenly you have two NUMA domains, and also the PCIe pins are divided. Some piece of defense goes, goes to eight of those, and some goes to eight of the other uh, things. So you can have more locality, and you can separate that even further. Uh, so uh, I, I did that, also basically to increase the parallelism and also avoid the uh, 
the inter, inter process communication and the locking between the various NUMA nodes. Also, if you do that, then suddenly the cache latencies become lower because the uh, internet process is segmented according to the latencies of the various cores to its cache. And since you're only using uh, half the distance to the cache, it gets lower. So this increases your overall performance. This is the most advanced uh, polyism configuration possible, I think, with this uh, Intel system. Um, so I switched this on, and uh, the thing doesn't boot anymore. Uh, so I had a, luckily, <laughs> so this took me about uh, six weeks of working with the BIOS engineers from uh, Super Micro to uh, fix this issue. Uh, luckily, they were highly motivated to get this going. And so I had access to uh, the lead engineer there and uh, went through several BIOS uh, iterations until this all worked fine. Uh, also, the reporting of the, of the drives to its NUMA uh, uh, numbers was wrong because I never considered that, okay, you also can separate the PCIe pins and they were just giving you the wrong results and so you couldn't get full performance because you went to the wrong, device, wrong devices, right? So, um, so this actually worked right finally and uh, then uh, we did some tests on all these things using the FIO tool. Everybody uses FIO, right? Uh, so most of the interesting things here were most of write speed. So we only do sequential writes here. That is the most relevant thing to do for uh, packet capture. And um, you just did uh, four gigabyte sequential writes. And if you want the tests and everything uh, that was used, the scripts to set up the system and, and stuff, it's on Gentoo.org at that URL. So uh, you can copy the scripts or and copy the setup for the uh, uh, tests if you want. Yeah, so if you segment the system, then you have, of course, issues now, right? So uh, applications that are running on this thing must access the local disk and not the disks on the other NUMA nodes, which means whenever you want to do integration of the data, you have to go through some gyrations here. Um, so that's um, uh, an issue. Uh, the file, actually, the file tool supports binding threads and, and files to nodes, and, and these options were used. I was very surprised by that. Uh, even the uh, super micro engineers didn't know about this. I tried to get to them to get this test, and they said it was not possible. And uh, they had never heard of, of the sub clustering. <laughs> so I uh, talked a lot with them, and I, I couldn't get them to do it, so I finally did it myself. <laughs> okay. So um, first thing is just to um, do some um, single thread performance. Run a single thread on all these configurations. And with that, oh, we get a super high number here, but we, we, don't, can't, we can't use this. Uh, this is basically the performance of a single thread. And we see with no NUMA, we get about two and a little bit here. With, with a regular two no NUMA, we get a bit down, and SNT gets even lower. The problem now is we are reducing the number of PCIe lanes and the amount of cache that these processors have. So the individual cache, individual performance of individual threads goes down. So we must compensate that by having more parallelism, having more of these things. Uh, so uh, this is very important if you want to design an algorithm to make use of this. And the other issue is we first used X4 and we had some issues there. Um, it doesn't scale too high, and so uh, um, throughput sinks rapidly, and uh, in our environment, we used uh, uh, X4 almost everywhere, and that's something we had most experience with, but that was not possible to do, so we had to switch all of this, uh, these tests for, to XFS as a result of this. So these are the uh, results of the test. Um, we have the, the various uh, uh, threads and uh, the various runs. So the, the first is, is the no NUMA. So we, uh, with no NUMA and XFS, we're getting to maybe two to three. And um, this becomes the SNC runs go quite high to about, uh, get about 30, 30K, 30 gigabytes per second. Uh, here with the SNC. And these, uh, the first SNC runs were all done after the system was running various tests for a long time. So memory was garbled. And, 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 so, and my goal was to get more than 40 gigabytes per second, and I couldn't reach it. So I said, what, what, what do you do? Okay, you need to have a memory defragmented. What do you do? Do, you do? How do you do this? You will reboot the system. 
<laughs> so I booted the system, and suddenly I was able to get 47 gigabytes per second for a couple of runs, and then it went down again to 30. Uh, this shows you that there's a need for uh, contiguous memory that is uh, not there in the long run. And, uh, uh, but you, you, know, you can basically get to 30 gigabytes per second pretty consistently with this. This means, since you have 12.5 gigabytes for one NIC, uh, you can at least run uh, two or maybe three of the 100 gig NICs on one system and dump the data onto the disk if you wanted to. That means if you have, have enough PCIe pins, which we, at this point we were out of ice PCI pins because the NIC required at least 16 and then the rest was running all the, the other stuff on, on Intel. But now we have, since then, the AMD came out and has more pins. Maybe with AMD you can probably do this. And also you can cut down the pins to the, to the um, drives because you can use PCIe 4. This is only using PCIe 3. So uh, dealing with memory fragmentation, uh, reboot is the obvious thing. After that, you have uh, the maximum uh, performance available because of the contiguity of, of uh, uh, the, the memory. There's another trick here. You can drop all the page cache. You can drop all the metadata caches with this uh, echo operation. And the system will kind of try the best it can, and it will be maximum available there without having to reboot the system. But it will have to read all the data back from this, all the uh, uh, cached information about files and data. So, and uh, the conclusion here is yeah, it is possible to get with the page cache to get extremely high performance, even with a page cache with all this, these promises, even with 4K, if you localize the path to data storage, you avoid cross-segment accesses, and you maybe reboot for ultimate performance. So it's not that... Uh, uh, you can't do this, it's just a matter of tuning the system in, in such a way that you do this and uh, then you have to live with certain restrictions. And if you don't want to go through all this, buy a system that doesn't have tiny page sizes. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I think, I was completely, I tested uh, power PC before, didn't have any issues there. But my management told me there's no chance that we're ever going to use PowerPC, <laughs> given uh, that we have to rewrite everything and stuff. And so this is how it is. Okay. Okay, that's my constant refrain that I've been preaching for over 10 years now. We need to have large contiguous segments of memory in order to get full performance. And uh, I published the first thing about this in 2007, actually, a paper on why this is, and I've tried various things. I hope, hopefully at some point we will have something. Conclusions, yes, yeah, so, um, basically, I repeat myself here, and I only have 10 minutes left. So, um, so there's work in progress by a few of our developers here. We've been trying to push that forward, but I think this, is a, this looks more like a long-range approach here. I think another two to five years will go along before we have anything, because we have to restructure basically the, the page cache and uh, have a deal with multiple page sizes and deal with various other issues and various subsystems. So I'm not hopeful that this is going to be solved in the short run. Uh, okay. Okay, if anybody wants to help, I'd be glad. We'd be glad to have your help to maybe move this forward a bit faster. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. So do you want I've got a microphone here. Microphone. If, um, <laughs> you just put your hand up, I'll bring you the microphone. Thank you. So do you want a 100 gig Ethernet plug into NVMe drives? <laughs> uh, you, need, you need to have the ability to, uh, in real time, to operate on the data. That's a problem. And if, if the data is in the NVMe drive, then I can't get to it. You still have to transfer it to the main processor, right? That's not useful. So, joke aside, so recently uh, Jens posted something on RWF uncached, I don't know if you followed, uh, which would be uh, uh, right through the page cache, and, but uh, invalidating the data right away because he doesn't need it uh, after that. Yes. Uh, what about the reserve, uh, the reverse uh, approach, which is, which would be direct IOs, but you say RWF cache. So you do a direct IO, but also load the page cache, please. Yeah, okay, it's good, cool idea. Yes. 
Because I do have a problem with direct IOs on SMR drives too, so yeah. I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just a comment about the last point and the IP stack support for 100G. Yes, but the networking people are not really sure what to do anyway, so that's that's a moving target. I know, we have the RDMA subsystem on the side and the uh, SPDK and also on the DPDK, so we are bypassing the IP thing manually. And the problem is if 100 gig becomes more prevalent, then less and less users will use the IP stack. At some point, you need to do something. Well, except that people still need to use TCP. And the only mature TCP implementations are in kernels, so... Have you ever tried to use TCP on a 100 gig link? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we had to uh, basically write protocols, new protocols based on UDP because we couldn't use the full bandwidth. No, well, you need, of course, you need to do gazillions of connection, and then they all retry randomly and, and cause you not to be able to use the full bandwidth. This, all, this, this breaks down a bit. Are there any other questions? Christoph, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you for coming. <laughs>